will, Romans chapter 10, and uh, we're going to get going here this morning, and a uh, big day, a lot of activity, a lot of things going on, so Romans chapter 10, and uh, verse number 1, if you will, Romans 10 verse 1, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above? Or who shall descend into the deep, that is, to bring up Christ again from the dead? But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, that is, the word of faith which we preach, that if thou confess, shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now I read down through that, and we're not going to get all those verses today, obviously. But we introduced the chapter last time, verse number one. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for God, uh, to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And we walk through the chapter and we introduce the chapter. And it's critical to understand that this chapter, chapter 10 specifically here we're talking about. But in this section, chapters 9, 10, and 11, Paul is dealing with the nation of Israel. And chapter 10 is Jewish in nature, and we need to remember that. Uh, if you come over to chapter 11, just to kind of remind ourselves, 11.11, 11, Paul here says, I say then, have they, and the they there is Israel. I heard a guy one time many years ago, he says, hey, you know, this is all about the Gentiles. No, the they here is Israel. That's verse 7. What then? Israel hath not. So we're talking about Israel. Have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. That's what chapter 9's about. They stumbled. They stumbled over the presence of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. In his incarnation, when you, we see it clearly, when the wise men show up and they're looking for the baby, the king of the Jews. And he's not a baby when they get there. He's an, he's an infant. He's, he's you know two years old at least. And uh, they're looking for him, and the reaction by the leadership, Herod and the chief priests and everything, is not one of, oh, yeah, he's right over here. We got him in the nicest hotel. It's, oh, no, what are you talking about? Let's go. So they, they stumble over that. We looked at Isaiah 7. We looked at Isaiah 8, and that issue of them stumbling over the incarnation. The greatest sign that God the Father ever gave Israel was Emmanuel. God with us. God's come, he's dwelling with us, and he's right there in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God. They stumble, they don't fall though, okay? But then he says, but rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. So then they do fall. And that's that Acts 1 to 7 uh, period of time where they do fall. Acts 7 with the stoning of Stephen, they do fall. And then what happens? Acts 9, gen salvation goes to the Gentiles. And then from 9 to 28, verse 12, now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. There's a diminishing period. And that diminishing period, chapters 9 through 28 of Acts, is where we're at in chapter 10. And what Paul's going to do in Romans 10 is he's going to say, here's, what I, here's what's going on in my Acts ministry with and to Israel. 
And again, verse 11, he's provoking them to jealousy. Verse 14, if by any means I might provoke to emulation, that issue of emulation, copycat. He, Peter says it in Acts 15, or James says Peter says it, but it's the idea of, hey, we have to go get saved now like they do, like the Gentiles do. So there's a provoking, there's an emulation here. If you look at verse 15, for if the casting away of them, again, Israel, be the reconciling of the world. See that casting away? When you cast stuff away, what do you do? You throw it away. It's useless. It's of no value. And at this point in time, the come back to chapter 10 of Romans, the nation of Israel is useless as a nation. They've lost their privileged status. They've lost that privileged relationship that they've had with God for well over 1,500 years. They've lost it. There's now going to be no difference. And what begins to happen now in chapter 10, again, the question is, is, all right, what does all that have to do with Romans 9, 10, and 11? Well, it has everything to do with it when you come into verse number 1, where Paul is talking here to the nation of Israel. By the way, I said it last time, I'll say it again, in the provoking ministry in the provoking ministry of Paul in the Acts 9 to 28, he never, capital letters, provokes the little flock, the believing remnant. What was his manner? Do you remember what his manner was? Into the synagogue. Who's in the synagogue? Apostate Israel is in the synagogue. See, he's in the synagogue. The believing remnant, they, they, they're hiding. They're, they're running. Remember Acts 8? Under the persecution of Saul of Tarsus, who is Paul, the apostle, eventually, what do they do? There's nobody in Jerusalem but the twelve. The believers have scattered. So he's not dealing with the circumcision. He's dealing with the apostate, the unbelieving element in Israel. That's who he's dealing with. And I'll be honest with you, it, as we come into this passage, because of verses like verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And what people say is, to see, that verse is the formula for Gentile salvation, and that is not true. If that's the case, then Joel, because that's a quote out of Joel, Joel has pre-told the Gentiles, about something that God said was kept secret, then guess what? Somebody's a liar. So then you make God a liar. So why? And how, again, how do you know? What does verse 1 say? Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And the point here, the only way to fully understand this chapter is to understand that it has to do with the diminishing away period of time in the life of the nation of Israel, as it's recorded for us in the book of Acts. And if you leave it where it sits and don't try, I, I know 10 10's a great, 10 10's a wonderful verse, isn't it? For with the heart man believes unto righteousness. And I know we use that verse, and, that, and it's legitimate to use it because it's accurate. But the thing is, is it, it, in the context, it's Paul talking to Israel. So as we begin to go through the details here this morning in these first seven, eight verses here, we need to remember in the back of our minds that what we're talking about is that diminishing period of time of Acts 9 to 28. And why that's important is because it will save you from trying to make... When that, that verse 9, that issue of confession, look down, look down at ver, look up at verse... Um, look at verse 6. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say, not in thy, what? Heart, 10.6. You see how the heart speaks? The heart talks? 
the heart is going to make a confession here. He's not talking about an audible thing. But what does religion do? They're going to make you work to get saved, aren't they? So they say, if you don't make an audible confession here, and by the way, read this prayer the right way, or read this statement, then you're not saved. So what did, what did religion do? He makes you got to work to get saved. And then you're working to stay saved. See, what happens is, is if you say that verse 9 is the formula for Gentile salvation, then you open yourself up to a performance-based justification. Because how do, you know, you've heard people say, pray the sinner's prayer and you'll get, praying the sinner's prayer doesn't get you saved. What gets you saved? Trusting that Christ died for your sins. That gets you saved. See? And they use verse 9. By the way, verse 11, for the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be be ashamed. That's a quote out of Isaiah. See, Paul is going to talk here, verse 5, for Moses. I mean, Paul uses Moses, he uses Joel, he uses Isaiah, he uses Psalms. He's using terminology that Israel is very familiar with in their scripture. Paul is dealing with the nation of Israel. He's not dealing with Gentile salvation. He is talking to Israel. He's taking Israel back into her history. And ultimately what's going to happen, he's going to take them to Deuteronomy 30. We're going to get there hopefully this morning. (laughs) And in Deuteronomy 30, Paul's going to tell them, listen, don't make the same mistakes that our forefathers made. Here's the history of not operating by faith. They had the word. It was given to them. They're told to write it on the doorpost, put it on their eyes, have it in front of them, teach them. They had it all. And you know what happened? They didn't respond by faith. They made a mistake. Paul's warning them here. So he's he's taking Israel, he's talking to Israel, Again, the chapter, Psalms, Isaiah, Joel, Moses, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, all of that is Old Testament. Why? Because he, there's something happening in his Acts ministry, 9 to 28, in that diminishing period that he's dealing with, with Israel here. In chapter 10, the first 13 ver- verses, we just read them, Paul is demonstrating that Israel is still stumbling. They stumbled over the Messiah, the earthly ministry of Christ. They, they, they stumbled. But now they're stumbling over, they stumbled over the Lord's claim to be the Messiah. See, That's what they stumbled over. He came in and said, I'm God. And ooh, they didn't like him for that. They hated him. They, that, that's actually, the, in the context in the Gospels, one of the first times you read about them plotting to kill him is right after he's done, messed around on their Sabbath day, did some things, and then shortly thereafter he says, I'm God. And woo, they didn't like that at all. Blaspheme, get him, let's get him. They missed his claims about being the Messiah. Now they're stumbling over the claims that Paul is going to be making about who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And in Acts 9 to 28, Paul goes in and he confronts Israel with the deity of the Lord and his accomplishments. And yet Israel still stumbles. They persecute Paul. They reject, they do. So those first 13 verses here, That's what's happening. Then in verse 14 to 21, Paul looks at them and says, you're still without excuse, Israel. You had it. Everything's here right in front of you. You can't say God never gave it to you. You can't say God never showed it to you. It's right here. It's here. It's here. It's here. And you still rejected it. So you are without excuse. So let's get into the details. 10.1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And again, saved 
Two, two things, saved how, okay, and then saved from what? Look at chapter 11. Look at 26, 11, 26. Israel had a national salvation. Now, we looked at this last time, but we'll look at it again. 11, 26. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall take away ungodliness from Jacob. Isaiah 59. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. There's Jeremiah 31, the new covenant. At, so there is a national salvation. But look at verse 14 of chapter 11. 11:14. 11, if by any means I might provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save, what's that next word there? Some of them. Paul's not after, Paul, in 10.1, Paul says, I would have Israel get saved. He's not talking about national salvation, 11.26 and 27. That's their program. He's talking about on an individual basis, not why. Because there's no difference now. God, in chapter 9, we learned God changed the program. There's a dispensational change. Now God is not dealing through the nation. He's not nation building. He's, he's forming the church, the body of Christ, that's made up of a Jew and a Gentile. Both entities making one new man, one new creature. So when you look here, back in chapter 10, he's not talking about Israel as the nation. He begins to now deal with the sum. So then the question is, is okay, what are they getting saved from? We'll look at verse 2. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of knowledge, but not according to, um, a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge, for they being, what? Ignorant. You see, he's wanting them to get saved from some ignorance. Ignorance of what? The righteousness of God. Because, do you know what Israel's, Israel, a Jew never, look, look, look with me at Galatians. You remember who Saul of Tarsus is, right, Paul? Look at Galatians uh, 3. I'm sorry, Galatians 2. <clears throat> I'm going to get ahead of myself here a little bit. Galatians 2. Look at verse 15. Paul has just rebuked Peter. Peter. They had the great meeting. Peter comes and eats lunch with them there. And the religious guys show up, and Peter withdraws himself from the Gentile table and goes sits over with them. And Paul rebukes him, and rightly so. But look at verse 15. We who are Jews by nature and not, what, sinners of the Gentiles. Israel's viewpoint, remember when the Lord came and he ate with the publicans and the sinners, and the Pharisees said, how dare he do that? Because what did they think they were? They were the righteous. They were holier than thou's. That's back in the Old Testament. The Lord tells them, don't you say that. See, see, they have a different viewpoint here. We can go back to Romans 10. But the thing is, and because we're going to talk about that here in just a minute, they have a zeal. Verse 2, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God. Now, zeal's good. Passion is good when it's applied correctly. There's two types of zeal. Passion. There's the Zeal based on achieving and striving to get the righteousness of God, i.e. religion. But then there's the zeal that comes from someone who already understands who they are in Christ. And, and, who, and that they already have the righteousness of God. One, the religious crowd, what are they trying to do? They're trying to get it. The other zeal is, I got it, so now I can go and be zealous and passionate for Christ. Because I have. We're blessed with all spiritual blessings. We're complete in Him. We're not we're not, we don't do what we do to strive to get. We've already gotten. We do it because, well, we're, I would hope you're thankful for what He's given to you spiritually. And that's the case. They have a zeal, but not according to what? Knowledge. That's the salvation. He goes, I want them to get saved. They're going to get saved by my gospel. We'll see that as we get down in verse 9 and 10 and so forth. 
but I want them to come out of that ignorance that they're in. And that ignorance is about who they are. Who are they? They're sons of Adam. That's who they are. I want them out of that. I want them to come over here, recognize their humanity, come to a, a point where they say, you know what, I am a sinner, and I need a Redeemer, I need a Savior. By the way, that's what the next verse is going to tell them. Verse 3, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteous to everyone that believeth. What does the law do? It points them to the need of a Savior. And they're ignorant of that. They're operating based on no knowledge. And that's ultimately their problem. Verse 3, for they being ignorant. Now again, in the context here, Israel has a zeal. They have passion. They just are going about it to establish their own righteousness. They're doing it in the energy of their own flesh. They're not doing it the way God would have them to do. I'll just say, Paul here, that great heart's desire, he knows that as Saul of Tarsus, he led the nation in their ignorance. He says it in Timothy, he says, I did this in ignorance and in unbelief. I was a blasphemer, a persecutor. I was operating, he was operating right where they are. He's been there, and he's been liberated from that. He tried, Paul goes, that, uh, the Philippians 3, the righteousness of the law, what? Blameless. Paul was, a, he sat at the feet of Gamaliel. He, he graduated from the leading school, seminary, in the, in, the, in the Jews' religion. He had the PhD, the TTD, the THD, the ABC. He had it all. He could come in and he could dissect that Old Testament and he kept it. He's a Pharisee. He's a fundamental Bible believer. That's what we would call him. He kept it. He just was operating where? In ignorance. Because he didn't believe who the Old Testament's going to point him to. Which is who? Christ. You follow that? Okay, it's only Super Bowl Sunday. We're okay. We'll get there. Okay. We'll be out about 4 o'clock this afternoon, okay? I'm just kidding. That's where we're at. Paul, has, Paul had a misplaced zeal based on ignorance. I, I read this stuff, I see it. You see it all around you. I, you see good people who mean well and who are you know, good churchgoers, as they would say, and yet where are they? They're, in, they're right here. And again, so that ignorant, the zeal issue is that there's a difference between someone who is working to attain, striving to get it, and someone who believes what God has said to them, and then sits back and says, yeah, I am who he says I am, and that's, that is I'm a sinner. My human condition is one of falling short of the glory of God. And because of that, I need a Savior, a Redeemer. So Paul is pressing an issue here with, with Israel. During the diminishing period, during that period of Acts 9 to 28, of an internal issue, a heart issue, not an external thing, not out there doing and not doing, but that fundamental issue of the heart. That's why he'll, he'll say there in, 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 in verse 10, for with the heart man believes unto righteousness. It, it's a heart thing. And this is why, really, ultimately, Paul here, we'll get over there, he's going to go back to Deuteronomy. Because he's going to point Israel and says, listen, God has already told you that this is going to be an internal issue. And that you need an internal change, a heart change. There's a reason why, when you read Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36, and you read those new covenants, and he says, I'm going to take away that stony heart and I'm going to give you a heart of flesh, a new heart, a new thing. Why? Because they, have a, they don't think they are sinners. Now look at verse 3. 
For they being ignorant of God's righteousness. Ignorant. Now, where has Paul already taught us about the righteousness of God? Chapters 1 to 5. So go back to chapter 3. In Romans, he's already dealt with the right the, the issue of the righteousness of God. God has already declared that every human, the condition of man, mankind, is fundamentally flawed. We fall short. We have a sin problem. Look at 321. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Notice, the righteousness of God is now being manifested how? Without the law. It's standing alone. Well, in 10.4, we're going to find out that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. See? 3.21, the righteousness of God with what? Without the law. Now we're, he's, the righteousness of God stands over here alone. Why? Why? Verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. That by faith of Christ. By the way, it's not faith in Christ. That's what the new Bibles do. It's faith of. If you have a Bible and it's got the word in there, you literally completely wipe out the mentality of the Savior and how he's thinking about what he needs to go and do for you, for your human condition. If you say in, you've just destroyed that thinking process of esteeming other better than himself and going and doing and functioning and operating according to the will of and the word of the Father. You've, you've wiped it out. It's gone. So don't do that. It's his faithfulness. By the way, how's your faith doing today? Your faith in God. Last night it wasn't doing so good. This morning a little better. Maybe tomorrow even better. Why? Because your faith is up and down. His faithfulness is what? Consistent. It's always there. So when you sit here and you talk about His faithfulness, the faith of Jesus Christ, you have two types of faith. You have objective faith. Jesus Christ is the object, I'm I'm sorry, objective. Jesus Christ is the object of our faith. But our faith wanes up and down, all over, here and there, okay? It isn't a consistent thing. Objectively, it's my faith in him. But the faith of Christ here is a subjective issue. Because it is his faithfulness in doing what the Father said needed to be done to fix and to help mankind. So it's subjective. Now, note, finish the verse. Unto all and upon all them that what? There's your faith in Christ. See how it's in the same verse? And by the way, you can go do this in Galatians where they mess it up in Galatians and they'll say faith in Christ. And right below that, it's your faith in him. Say, you got to just leave it alone, read the doctrine, it's okay. It's the Lord came, he loved all of us, he died for everyone, but it's only going to be applied to and accredited to the account of them that believe. That's why verse 23, he says, for all have sinned, I'm, I'm sorry, the end of verse 22, for there is no, what, difference. Why? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 3 9, what then are we better than they? No and no wise, for we have before proved both Jew and Gentile that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. You, that's the human condition. And he went and died for it. And you know what Israel was? Ignorant of that. They had a zeal, not according to knowledge. What would have knowledge? What would faith have said? Yep, there he is. And they, nope, that's not him. Kill him. And off they go. So Israel's problem, come back to chapter 9 of Romans. Israel's problem and what Paul's pressing (laughs) is, well, in Paul's gospel message that he's communicating 
to Israel during the diminishing, during 9 to 28. By the way, prior to chapter 9, Paul was not on the scene. He was on the scene as Saul of Tarsus. That's why I try to make the distinction. See, he's a persecutor. He's out there killing them. He's con giving consent. Acts 9, the road to Damascus, we have the salvation of Paul and the commissioning of Paul in one event. And off he goes. That's why he'll say, in me first, I'm the first guy in. Here we go, boom, off he goes. And that message that he's going to be communicating to Israel is this issue that there is no difference in our human condition. We are all sinners. Now, can you imagine a Jew hearing from a guy that was their hero at a moment in time, that now they're, they are a sinner? I think he's rubbing the cat's fur the wrong way. They didn't, that's why he starts chapter 9 of Romans. I lie not. I speak the truth. What's he doing? Look at Israel's idea of their human condition, 9-4. Look at how they think. Romans 9 and verse 4. Who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promise who are the, whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came who is over all God bless forever. Amen. Look at, they don't think they're sinners. We could run the verses till the cows come home about where they look at the Lord. They go to his disciples and they say, how can your master sit with publicans and sinners and eat? And the Lord goes, look, I didn't come to heal. The, 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 those that aren't sick don't need the physician. I didn't come to heal you guys. I came over here for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I came for sinners and people who need. That Pharisee sits there and he says, Lord, I tithe on the mint and I do this. And he beats on his chest. And that publican can't even lift his eyes to the mercy seat and begs for mercy. And the Lord says, that man goes home justified. You're of your father, the devil. You're a white sepulcher with dead man's bones inside. That's who you are. Why? Because they operated on the basis of ignorance, unbelief. Israel's mentality is that they, there was a difference between Israel and the Jews. There's a difference here. Acts 10, P Peter gets sent to Cornelius. You know the story. How many times did the Lord have to tell Cornelius to go? Three times. Because every time he said, I need you to go to Cornelius, he's, what did Peter say? Sure, okay, Lord, I'm going in a, in a little bit. No, he objected. He said, not so. I'm not doing that. I don't go down there and talk to those dogs, Gentile dogs. I don't go do that. No. And what did the Lord finally say? Look, look, Pete, don't call unclean what I now call clean. Go down there. You see, Peter understood he, there is a difference. Go back to chapter 10. And Paul, the gospel of the grace of God, that message that Paul is going to now start in Acts 9 and follow in, in 28 to, through 28 and that diminishing, that message of the grace, of the gospel of the grace of God breaks down that middle wall of partition. It destroys it. And that's Paul's message to Israel in that Acts period. There is no difference between you and the Gentile. You are all sinners. And the reason for it is because God changed the dispensation. He changed the program. By the way, he doesn't declare that the Gentiles are to be just like Israel. He doesn't say the Gentiles are being promoted. He says, Israel, you're what? You're right down here where you really belong. You're a sinner. Everybody, is, there is no difference. And, it, that, and honestly, that's Israel's hang-up, is verse 3 there, 10-3. They're going about to establish their own righteousness. That works of righteousness. They have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. That's, their, that's it. They got this zeal. They're doing the outward they're doing the outward demonstration of no faith inside. They're just doing it because that's what we do. 
They have a zeal. They're committed to living under the law. That's why in verse 4, well, verse 5, Paul says that the man which doeth those things shall what? Live by them. They're committed to it. They're just doing it ignorant and an unbelief. Verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. The end. Now, you can take the end several different ways. The end, as in the goal. Or, it's the termination point. We come to the end of the meeting. Whew, finally. Not really, but okay. What is it? It's, we're done. But what is Christ here? There's a dual application here with Christ. He is the end in that he does terminate a system of outward performance. He says, I've come to fulfill the law, not destroy it. I come to do everything that law required for the Messiah to do, he did every point. Luke 24, 44, he says, listen, what Moses, what the law and the Old Testament the prophets and Psalms talk about, I have so fulfilled. I'm done. I've done it. So he is the end in that he does bring to a conclusion that outward performance system. But he's also the end in that he is the ultimate goal of the law. Because what was the, the design of the law? Come over to Galatians 3. You have to remember this. Galatians 3. Galatians 3, verse 24. We looked at this last time as well. Galatians 3, 24. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified, how? By faith. But what is the law? It's a schoolmaster. What's a, what's a teacher do? The schoolmaster, what do they do? They have, a, they have a curriculum to teach you something, to get you from kindergarten to senior high graduation. They have a, there's a system of thinking. What was the system under the law? Thou shalt not. Top ten, the first ten commandments lay out the ten major categories of the rest of the law is where they're going to fit and so forth. And nine of them are moral. Morality. One of them is ceremonial. The keeping of the Sabbath day. And you sit there and you look at that in the law, but it's designed to, what is it designed to do in Israel? The schoolmaster is designed to bring us to who? Christ. It's designed to, listen, as a Jew, doing the law, you could not do the law. The goal of the law, the law continually pointed to someone, pointed to Christ. You couldn't do it. Go back to Romans 10. The school, he's the end of it. He's the point. He's the one. By the way, don't forget in Galatians 3 there, you're just there, there to be justified how? By faith. faith, that, faith that issue of faith is all the time there. The law, verse 4, the Christ is the end of the law of the right, uh, I'm sorry, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Galatians 3, just, justified by faith. Verse 5, here's the problem with the law. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law. Here it is. By the way, this is a quote out of Leviticus 18, verse 5. So if you want to run back to Leviticus 18, you can. But what, what is it? That the man which doeth those things shall live by them. The, right, the law, the righteousness of the law demands unbroken compliance, unbroken obedience. It demands perfection, perfectness, <laughs> perfection. And yet it's going to bring you to who? To the only one who can do that, Christ. Because you can't do it. When the Jews broke the law, what did they have to do? You go back to Leviticus and Deuteronomy, where he re-gives the law, 
And they have a whole schedule of sacrifices to bring when they break the law and do. And then he ultimately says, hey, I don't want your sacrifices. I want your heart. I'm after your heart. But they're over here doing what? Sacrificing. The law points to the fact that there's no one righteous. No, not one. Points to the fact that you can't do it. In Exodus 19, when they say, everything you tell us to do, Lord, we're going to do it. Give us your word, we'll do it. And you know what they do? They break his word right off the bat. Because rule number one was, thou shalt not have no other gods before me. And what are they doing down in the camp? They conned Aaron into making them a golden calf, and they're down there Baal worshiping already. What would eventually be Baal worship? They're doing it already. They broke it. They didn't, it, didn't, it didn't take them any years or not. It took them days, hours, boom, and it's done. And it should have pointed right off. And you know what? It didn't. And the Lord, well, he said it in. Verse 5, 10, 5. For Moses described it, the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But, by the way, James says that if you break one of the least of these commandments, you're guilty of what? All of it. You can't do it. That's the point. Verse 6. I love this, but. <laughs> Don't miss the buts. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thy heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. Now, it's very interesting to catch what's happening here because Paul is now going to Deuteronomy 30, and he's taking Israel to Deuteronomy 30. But notice in verse 6, But the righteousness which is of faith, what? Speaketh on this wise. That issue of wise, here's the manner in which the righteousness of faith speaks, thinks. Here's the words that the righteousness of faith is going to use. And then Paul goes in, and again, in his Acts ministry, and he's just demonstrating to Israel, you guys are living under this law system, a system of performance, trying to gain eternal life. And now, in the but now, in the dispensational change, the issue here now is, is that issue of the righteousness of faith, and you don't have it. You didn't have it there, and you don't have it here. So Paul now is going to take them to Deuteronomy 30. And he's going to press in Israel. He's going to use a principle of faith that was in Israel's past. He's going to use that, and he's going to confront them. He's not teaching a new principle here. He's teaching something that they should be very well aware of. Because where is it? Deuteronomy 30. Moses said this. And you guys love Moses. He's read daily in the synagogues. And yet, the issue is going to be the issue of faith. The only response that God has ever accepted from man has been faith. Paul is not talking about the content of their faith here. He's talking about them just having faith. You know what I mean by content? What, what did, when God dealt with Adam and Eve, what did God, what did God expect from, Adam, from Adam's faith, if you will? What was Adam to believe? If you eat of that tree, you're going to die. That's, that's it. No death, burial, and resurrection. Look, you remember Noah? Noah, build the boat. Judgment's coming. Flood's coming. No death, burial, and resurrection. Just do what? Go build the boat. So what did Noah do? He believed God and went and built the boat. He's a preacher of righteousness, Hebrews calls it. You see, the content of faith is the message at the time to man. So, But he's talking here now about just the simple issue of having faith. And that issue of having faith is always an inner 
thing. It's always an activity of the heart, the soul. Faith speaks. It's going to say some things here. Now, go back to Deuteronomy 30. And we'll Deuteronomy 30. Deuteronomy 30. In verse 11. Deuteronomy 30, 11. Here's the quote. Now, by the way, in Romans 10, verse 6 and 7, you, you'll see the parentheses. That's Paul's commentary. You won't find that stuff in Deuteronomy. That's Paul making commentary about some things, okay? And we'll hit on that next time. But look at Deuteronomy 30. Look at verse 11. For this commandment, which I command thee this day, is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It, it is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us? And again, what is Paul's commentary? That is, to bring Christ down from above. Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us, but that we hear it and do it? But the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. And off he goes. Go back up there to verse 11. Paul is going to go now to Deuteronomy here in in Romans 10. And he's going to say some things here. Verse 11 what does verse 11 say to Israel? This is Moses writing to Israel. I command, it is not hidden from thee. This commandment, which I command thee this day, is not hidden from thee, neither is it far of it. If you go back to chapter 11, you start in verse 17. They're to write that commandment on the doorpost, on their eyelids. They're to come over here to memorize it. They're to verbalize it. They're to teach their children. Their children is to teach their children. It's a continual issue. The word isn't hid from them. The commandment is right there. They've got it. It's right in front of them. They're to do it. Verse 12. It is not in heaven that it that thou shouldest say. See, it's not sitting just up in heaven. And what do we got to do? We got to beg for it to come down. It's already here. It's already been given. Don't cry. You know what's going to happen one day? There's going to be a Jew that stands at the great white throne judgment, and he's going to say, I never knew it. And you know what the judge is going to say? Oh, yes, you did. It's right here. You had. What does Romans 3 say? Or Romans 2 say there? The, The great advantage that Israel had was that they had the oracles of God. They had the Word of God. They've got it right here. It's right in front of them. You, so what Moses is telling them, you can't say we never had the truth. You can't say we never had the Word of God. We had to beg for Him to come down and give it to us. And He never did, by the way. Well, why would they say that? Because they stumbled over the Messiah. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they stumbled over him. And there he is, fulfilling the word. Paul's like, you can't say that. So Paul is going to make a connection here to what he's going to do in his Acts ministry. And he's saying, Israel, you cannot claim that God didn't tell you about your Messiah. And you can't say that God never told you about the dispensation of grace. Because here I come. And when he shows up in his earthly, in his Acts ministry, verse, chapters 9 to 28, God is telling Israel what he's doing now, in the but now, in the dispensation of grace. And he's doing it through the ministry and the message proclaimed by the Apostle Paul. They are, no excuses is right. 30 verse 12. Who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us that we may hear it and do it. They, they're not, they got the zeal, let's do it, but they have what? No faith. They're doing it in ignorance. They're going about to 
justify themselves. Verse 13, neither is it beyond the sea. Who shall go over to the sea for us and bring it unto us that we may hear it and what? Do it. Again, you guys have the zeal, no doubt about it, but you're just functioning in ignorance. Verse 14, but the word is very nigh unto thee. Now watch, in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. What is Romans 10 going to get into? The heart speaks. Come back to chapter 10. Chapter 10 of Romans. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, say not in thy heart, verse 6. Verse 8, but what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith, now watch, which, what? We preach. You see, Paul goes back and says, look guys, the principle of operating on faith and the faith in God's word to you is nothing new. You had it back there in Moses, and you got to have it today with me and what I'm going to teach you and what I'm going to tell you. And you can't say God never told us because guess what? I'm standing right here. Come back to Acts 9. Watch Paul do this. We got a few minutes. Look at Acts 9. And Paul does do Paul in Acts, you guys have a principle of faith and, and the word of God given to you, quoting Deuteronomy 30, and he says, you've got that. So what I'm telling you is nothing new. You can't say God never told us. They can't say God never said that Jesus Christ was Messiah. Because what does Luke 24 say? Everything the Old Testament talked about, I fulfilled. It points right to his Messiahship. Now Paul shows up and says, hey guys, guess what? There's no difference. God changed the program. And now we're in the dispensation of grace and we're doing this now. And they say, no, you're not. You big old liar. And boom, and they blow up all. And they can't say God never said anything about what he's doing today in the age of grace. Look at Acts 9. Look at verse 22. Acts 9, 22. But Saul, and this will be Paul, increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. Now think about, this is Acts 9. He's getting going here. And what's he doing? He's confronting, confounding the Jews. He's down at the synagogue. And he, but he's teaching them about who, though? About the very Christ. Don't miss the word very. He's sitting there talking to them. He, he's not, by the way, Saul. He's not a friend of Christ. Saul of Tarsus, let's say it like that, okay? He's not a friend of Christ. He's not a friend of the little flock. They're scattered because of him. And yet now what is he doing? Hey, that guy that I used to persecute you about, guess who he is? He's the very Christ. He's Messiah. He, that issue of very Christ, beyond a shadow of, the, of a doubt, he's the Jehovah of the Old Testament. That's who he is. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, he is the very Christ. He is the Messiah. He's confounding the Jew. Could you imagine being a Jew going, huh? wait a second, I thought you were on our side. <laughs> when did you switch sides, you know? And he says, hey, here's what's going on. Come over to chapter oh, 17. Chapter 17. Very fascinating. When you, when you quit trying to make Paul's ministry and Acts fit your agenda or your theology, and just let it say what it says, your eyes will be opened. It's fantastic. Acts 17, verse 1. And when they had passed through Am Am Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. Now, again, who's in the synagogue? Not the believing remnant. Not the little flock. Not the circumcision. Who's there? The apostate nation. The unbelieving Jews. 
as Paul, now watch, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening, as his manner was. It would do you well to realize, to accept, to adjust to the fact that Paul and his acts ministry, provoking ministry, he had a habit. He had a manner. And his habit was his heart's desire for Israel is that they be what? Saved. He had a habit of going to the Jew first. He had a habit of going into the synagogue. One, he probably still had his card to get in. But two, who are they? They're his flat. They're his people. So if you really want to understand Paul's ministry in Acts, you have to remember his habits. And his habit here is laid out for us that what does he do in verse 2? He goes into the synagogue, and three days, what does he do? He opens and alleging. He's reasoning with them out of the Scriptures. Well, wait a minute, Rick. He, Paul hasn't written a word. He, if he's written anything by this time, it's Galatians and Thessalonians, and that's it. He's getting ready to write Corinthians and Romans. See, the thing is, is he's not using his writings. He's using Moses, the law, the prophets, and Psalms, Luke 24, 44. He's using their old scripture, their old testament. He pops that thing open and says, here he is. Here's who Christ really was. He was Messiah. He is Jehovah. That's who he is. And that's the guy I'm preaching to you now. Look at verse 3, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preached unto you, notice, is Christ. Now, how did Peter preach the death, burial, and resurrection of, of Christ in, in Acts 2? Actually, Acts 2, 3, 4. A good thing or a bad thing? A bad thing. You murdered him. With wicked hands you crucify. How's Paul preaching him now? Hey, that's the way to, to what? Eternal life. Justified by faith. Faith in who? Or what did, look at who. Who died? Who died there and was buried and rose again? He is Christ. He's Messiah. Now look at the next verse, how it says. And some of them, what? believed. He goes into that synagogue and he preaches that Christ, that Jesus Christ is Messiah, is Jehovah, and that he died for them and he was buried and he gives them his gospel. And what's the result? Some of them become members of the body of Christ. They are Jews and he's rescuing them from ignorance and unbelief. And that's what his message is doing. Chapter 18, quickly here, verse 5. When Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. Drop down to verse 28. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly showing by the Scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Notice that Paul uses the Scriptures to do this. Not opinion, not attitude, not thought. So come back to Romans 10. we got to quit. When you come here, these first eight verses, Paul uses Deuteronomy 30, and he says, listen, the very words that were to be in your hearts and in your mouth should have made you recognize who he was. But because you're in ignorance and unbelief, and you're seeking your own righteousness, you missed him. You stumbled over him. And now I'm standing here in front of you telling you about the same guy, but now it's going to be on an individual basis. And he's doing things a little... We're preaching Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. And now it's your faith directly in him. And guess what, Israel? You have a renewed opportunity to come to eternal life 
just today in the dispensation of grace. Why? Because there is no difference. All of sinners, human condition is that of everybody. And he's changing the program. So we'll pick up in verse 9, not next week, but the following week, because I won't be here next week. And we'll get into the mouth and the confessing thing. By the way, that's terminology that Israel is very familiar with. There's no question about it. A Gentile would never do verse 9. Sorry. They don't have any idea what it is, what it means. But Israel does. Israel's very... And by, by the way, if you look there in 10.9, just, I know it's time to quit. Believe in thy heart that Christ hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You see that thing about being raised from the dead? Israel went after Paul because he preached that Christ was resurrected. They go after him. They throw him in chains to a Roman centurion. He stands before Agrippa and Festus and Felix and those guys, and he says, listen, the Pharisees believe in the resurrection, and that's what I'm talking about. The Sadducees don't. That's why they're sad, you see. They believe in it, and yet they're over here condemning me, and I have done no wrong. What are they getting him? They're getting him because he's saying who? That guy you killed over there a year and a half ago, a couple years ago, several years ago, he's Jehovah. He's Messiah. And you killed him. So they go and hang him. <laughs> they go after Paul. Okay? Anyway, some things to think about there. We'll pick up in verse 9 in, a couple, in two weeks' time. Okay? All right, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. And above all, Lord, we just thank you for who we are in your son, for the change in the program, for your wisdom, for your knowledge, and for your understanding in all of that. And we'll give you the praise and the honor and glory. In your name we pray, amen.